uh, live in studio with Emily every Monday at 11 o'clock uh, Mountain Time. So I am super excited to have everybody join us from, we've got the Facebook groups. This is streaming live to Facebook groups as well as our my YouTube channel. And I have a really special guest who's a good friend of mine today. And we are going to dive into some really important questions. I get a lot of questions um, in the Facebook groups about copyright and restrictions for um, artists. So Lonnie, let me, um, let me just say, Lonnie is my good friend. We, um, he actually grew up with my husband. He and my husband went to school together, high school and college together, and we've known each other for a long time. And Lonnie is an attorney in Salt Lake City, and he has helped me with a few things. Um, and so I invited him to come on and help us kind of understand copyright and trademark and whatnot. Um, specifically, I think copyright is what we're what we're dealing with. So um, let me just kind of help Lonnie understand he's not a quilter and he maybe doesn't understand entirely about collage quilting. So let me, Lonnie, for your benefit, just kind of explain what's happening. Um, so collage quilts, Lonnie, are, we've got, you can kind of see this is a collage quilt behind me and it's different than a traditional quilt in that it is something that looks more like a piece of art, right? Like we're creating an image, either a landscape or a, I've got a horse or, or, but the idea is that we can use photographs um, to create an image. And um, this is a relatively new form of quilting and it really has opened up the world for us as quilters because anything that we look at now, um, we, uh, we, our little brains are spinning and we think, oh, I can make that into a collage quilt. And so particularly online right now, you, you know, we've got Pinterest and we've got gr Facebook groups and all of these places where we're getting inspiration as artists from other people's artwork and other people's photography. And a question has been, well, if I see something online, if I see a beautiful photograph that somebody has posted online, can I use that photograph for my own use? And, um, and then, so that's one question. And then another question is, you know, if you put, if you put your artwork out there, what, um, do you own the copyright? So if I put a pattern and images of my pattern out there, um, what protections do I have from people stealing my idea? And do I need to worry about that? So there are just a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of questions that we as a community have about copyright. So Lonnie, let's start with maybe having you. Hi, everybody. As you hop on, I love to see you. Um, see where you're from. This is so fun. So Lonnie, we get people from all over the world, as you can see, from Germany and Brazil and all over the country. And um, and we've got like these people hop on every every Monday and say hello to me. And I just love it. We are a really tight community. We um, we love um, we interact a lot with each other. So I, it's it's a, just a wonderful um, opportunity to engage with this with this um, technology that we've been blessed with. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Lonnie for a few minutes. I want him to just talk about the basics of copyright, what it means, and um, maybe kind of address that idea of seeing something out there in the digital world. And Lonnie, if you have any questions, if you need clarification, just ask, ask me questions and I'll clarify as best I can. Um, but let's just kind of have a dialogue. So Lonnie, what are your thoughts? <laughs> so um, I, I uh, so copyright is one type of right uh, in a category that we call intellectual property rights. And since we have such an international group here, I'll try to, uh, I, I'm gonna naturally kind of focus on US, but it's often not that different in other countries. Um, so copyright is one right, but the oldest right is a trademark mm -hmm. and trademarks arose out of 
uh, really a related industry out of the Weavers Guild. Uh, and about 1500, some of the Weavers Guilds in Britain uh, started having uh, an individual maker of cloth would put a combination or a pattern of uh, colors of threads on the edge of, a, uh, of the, each cloth they made. And the purpose right. was to say, this is really my cloth. You know huh. me, you know, you know my edge. And, uh, and so this is, this is you, you can rely on it. And, and what the, the, the important thing in the, in the development of the legal right wasn't so much that they were doing this, but that it started to, th things would go to court. Someone would copy an edge, uh, this mark, and they would go to court and then someone would go to court and the, and the, and the courts in Britain started saying, that's a kind of fraud because you're trying to say you're not, you know, John Johnson, but you put John Johnson's mark and, so that people would think you have the same quality as John Johnson. And so you've <laughs> defrauded your, your people. And, and then that became something that not only could the buyer uh, complain about, but the this the person who owned the mark could complain about, and so the so the so the first thing I want to talk about is trademark, which is a, an indication of the source and the quality. Uh, and so you know, as I as I look at your really stunning quilt behind you, uh, that's just really beautiful. Hey. Um, if you had a mark on there that said somehow this is an Emily Woodward creation or an Emily Taylor creation. If you put, uh, you know, a, a ET on it or somehow some mark that you routinely put on your, uh, on your quilts, that's a mm -hmm. trademark. Okay. And it says, it says, this is made by Emily Taylor and you can rely on it for Emily Taylor's usual quality. Um, hmm. And uh, the second idea is a, is a patent. And a patent is for something that is useful. And so uh, a couple of these questions that people had, uh, that these written questions that Emily sent to me, uh, refer to methods or, or uh, ways of doing it. And, uh, and that would have to be patented. And the thing about a trademark is in the United States, you can register a trademark and that gives you, uh, it applies to the entire United States uh, in your area of expertise. So Emily Taylor would apply to quilting. It might not apply to soft drinks unless you get into that business. Mm -hmm. Um, so in, so, so quilting would, would certainly be an area that, uh, and it would apply anywhere, but, and that requires registration with the patent and trademark office. Mm -hmm. But even if, but if you do it, even without doing that, if you just start using a mark, it's protected from state to state within the areas that you use it in your area. So if you just use it in, you know, Utah, Nevada and, and California and someone mm -hmm. starts competing and using that same mark, then that would be a problem. Uh, you, you, you would have a, a claim on that. Um, and that applies uh, to like my mark, my trademark, my name on such and such or collage quilter yeah. on such and such. Got it. Yes. Yeah. So, but okay. a patent, you have to, you have to make a pat patent application and there's really tight deadlines. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and if it, if it gets out into the world and a year goes by uh, and you haven't got applied for a patent, mm -hmm. then you, it's just, everybody can use it. Everybody fair can game. use that technique. Yeah. It's fair right. game. And, and, and to get a patent, you, you really have to have a lawyer and, and it's going to cost you Ten to twenty thousand dollars. It could be more, but probably, oh. you know, a, a, a new binding for the edge of a quilt. You know, that, you, that's probably what you're looking at. But if you okay. start doing a new binding and you don't protect it, anybody can use that binding after about a year. Got it. So, for example, so I've kind of developed this technique where I use parchment paper. It's I, I call it my parchment pressing technique. And I have been using it. I've been sharing it. I don't, I'm not really interested in 
spending $20,000 to patent it because to me that's a lot of money and I've already started sharing it and if that's okay. You know what? It's out there. There's nothing. I'm not going to worry about protecting that technique, right? So anybody yeah, right. can use that technique. Okay. Yep. And uh, you just made the world a better place by allowing your technique to be used. Okay. Um, and, and so then uh, a, a fourth, uh, I'm going to do copyright last. So okay. another one is, is trade secret. And okay. a trade secret has to be a secret. Uh, uh -huh. it, it's a way of doing things and you don't release it into the public. People okay. don't know about it. And if somebody that maybe works for you goes out and starts competing with you and using your trade secret, you can, that's a problem. You can make a claim about that. Okay. So, so copyright appears to be the most uh, relevant and right. copyright is, is pretty broad. Uh, and in the United States, you used to have to have a, you used to have to make a mark on the thing you want copyrighted, but they, we did away with that maybe 20 years ago. And so mm -hmm. any, any artistic thing that you produce, whether it's writing or a painting or a photograph or a quilt is subject to copyright. And it's assumed that you have a copyright. Automatically, if you produce something, there's an assumed right, an assumed copyright. It's yours. You put it out there. You created it. So it's an right. assumed copyright without even registering the copyright. Right. Uh, okay. And, and I, I think that the rule is still, if you wanted to sue about it, you'd have you to need. register it. Okay. But, but, but you know, if it, this, this uh, quilt behind you, if, if you, if somebody yep. copied it and you wanted to sue them, you might have to register it at that point. Uh, and okay. That, I'm not even sure about that anymore, but you don't have to okay. put any mark on it. You don't have to say, uh, I want to protect this. It's, it, it's presumed to be protected unless you do okay. something. So it's not protected. And okay, if it's not that, protected, it's called in the public domain. Right. Okay. So that's really interesting, Lonnie, because a lot of us have assumed that over the year, well, I, I knew this, that producing artwork, because I've been a fabric designer, that I actually don't need to get a copyright for every design that I do because there is this presumed, this presumption of copyright. Um, but a lot of us probably didn't understand that, that when somebody else puts something out there online, that's a piece of their artwork, you are not automatically entitled. It's not assumed that it's in the public domain. We can assume that if somebody posts something on Pinterest or in a Facebook group that they own it, you don't own it just because it's there, just because it's online. It's not fair right. game for you to access. Right. OK. And they're there. So sometimes people intentionally make something public domain or they don't make a claim to it. And, OK. And, you know, lots of times in the law, probably the most powerful legal um, idea is waiver, which is you have a right and you don't do anything about it. OK. Um, and and so if uh, like, let's say let so. As a general rule, if you see a picture, a photograph online, uh, you can't use that photograph for to make a quilt. We call making a quilt from a photograph a, a derivative work. Uh, okay. it, you, there's the original work and then you derive it. And one of the rights of having a copyright is the right to make a derivative work. Um, so if you're going through like, uh, and so let's say, let's say I have a picture of a, of a giraffe that I took okay. in Africa and you go online and you say, Oh, this is a cool giraffe. I'm going to make a quilt with it. And I don't say it's okay. And I haven't said it's my picture is public domain. I published it. I put it online, but I mm -hmm. put it online for my own benefit and uh -huh. I let people see it, but that doesn't mean I, I let people copy it or move it. Now okay. in the, in the internet world, there's a lot of, there are a lot of exceptions to that. Sometimes lots of times people expect things to become memes. Um, they expect things to get legs. They want people to share. Right. right. Um, and, and that may be enough to, to put it into the public domain. Um, okay. Uh, but, but it depends on the exact circumstances. And it can, get a, yeah. it can be a pretty tight legal issue. So if you want to be safe, don't copy. What, what you can do is you can take, uh, take something and, and significantly change it and then use that. 
Okay. Um, if you took my if you took my giraffe and you you know bent the neck different and you know you I, I how much do you have to change it? Uh, you have to change it enough. <laughs> um, okay. And the, the law is full of these things where the it's um, at one of my law school classes that was we talked a lot about what was reasonable. And my teacher mm-hmm. used to say, if anyone said, well, what is reasonable under these circumstances? My teacher would say seven. It just depends <laughs> on what the court what the court says. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's the kind of thing where you you can invite litigation and get yourself in a lot of trouble. And, you know, one of the main things is if someone ever sends you a letter and says, I noticed you did this. Don't uh-huh. do that. Then pull it. Get it. Don't <laughs> stop selling it. Um, stop competing with that person or, or holding out that person's art. But at okay. some point, at some point, you uh, some other art you've taken it and, and made it and abstracted it so much that it really is your art. It's really a okay. new thing. Okay. Um, also when you, when, if you Google images, if you search in images online, lots of times there's a place where you can pick, I only want to see things in the public domain. Uh-huh. And there are lots of things in the public domain. Okay. Another thing is there are a lot of, uh, uh, sources of photographs where you can pay them some small right. amount and then you have the right to use it. And right. I and I do, I do that a lot. I, I like doing that because it's this little economy, you know, I can purchase, I can make sure the photographer gets compensated and then I get to have the right to use that design, use that image to create design. So I do that all the time. Um, and, and how much does that tend to cost? You know, it depends on the image and and my use. So if I'm going to use it for myself, if I just want to create it myself, it's really cheap. It's not expensive at all. If I want to reproduce that image and put it in a pattern or something, then I have to buy an extended commercial license, which is significantly more. But I mean, it's still like, oh, maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars versus to just use it for my personal use, it's maybe 10 bucks, something like that. So it's totally reasonable. And then you avoid all the complications that might arise from just stealing somebody's image online. And you can feel good knowing that you've supported another artist or another photographer in their work. So there are those marketplaces where images are for sale, iStock, Graphic River, um, Envato, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, so I encourage our audience to to look at those sources rather than just pulling stuff off of Pinterest or, you know, the thing with Pinterest, people are putting things on Pinterest to promote their websites or their designs or whatever. And it it's not a good idea to just steal things off Pinterest. <laughs> um, yeah. Pinterest so, is good for getting ideas. Yeah, it's fabulous. Not final products. That's right. Okay, so Lonnie, one other really, this is super, super helpful, very interesting, and I'm sure the audience is really appreciating this discussion. Um, here's another question for you. So let's look at this quilt back here. Now, what I've done with this quilt, Lonnie, is it's made with all these different pieces of fabric, right? So I have purchased the fabric that was created you know these are all designed by different designers and i and they're being compensated for the purchase that i made and then i cut it up into pieces and i use it in my quilt and now i want to sell my quilt or sell design you know sell a design reproduce this design even so I'm using someone's design to then create another product that I want to sell. Can you talk to that a little bit? Does yeah, that make so sense? In, yeah. So when you buy a, cl- a piece of cloth, it's mm-hmm. understood that you're going to use that piece of cloth to do something. You're going right. to make clothes or you're going to make a quilt or, you know, uh, a parachute maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but and, and it's not and it's really none of the seller's business. When, once they sell it to you, you can use it um, in some countries. Okay. They have uh, an idea called moral. I think it's called moral rights. 
And that mm -hmm. is the idea that an artist, when you create a, a, a piece, you have a moral right to say how it ought to be displayed and stuff. We don't have that in the United States, but we have a significant international audience here. So lots of places in Europe have have that kind of an idea. So okay. even, you know, if, if, if Andy Warhol makes a piece of art and it gets displayed in a uh, in a offensive way or a way that okay. is offensive to him, he can say, no, 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 no. But in the United yeah. States, if once you sell your art, you've sold your rights. OK, um, got it. And so, and, that, and so so each piece of cloth that you incorporate, it's intended. They know you're going to use it for something. And okay. here there's there's no one piece of of cloth or one pattern or design that make that is the whole thing. It, it, you've, right. you've taken little tiny bits. One one idea is fair use. And when you buy something or, or use it, you, you can you, there's fair use. Um, if you watch, uh, and so, and that's how they get away with uh, a meme with a picture, a, a single frame from the Lord of the Rings with yeah. a satirical right. thing. And so, you, you, you know, you're not stealing the whole movie of the Lord of the Rings. You're just stealing, uh -huh. you know, you're, 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 you're using one frame and you, and, uh, satire is another exception. You can satire okay. something. That's um, interesting. I, I don't know that you satire very much with quilts, but you could. <laughs> um, um, so an academic another, comment is another one. And, oh, an academic comment. Okay. To, yeah, another so, way so, to. Yeah. So you could take a, let, let's say you, you get a picture from Pinterest or let's say, let's say there's a, the original photograph that you probably can't, don't have a right to republish the original photograph. But if you're published something that says, this is how I go from the photograph to the final quilt. You could yep. say this is the original because because you're it's sort of an academic learning okay. training kind of an idea. Got it. OK, that's really helpful. Um, one other question. So I, I think I understand this, too. And so as a designer, I'm putting out patterns and people are using my patterns to create a piece of art and they will often ask me, well, can I sell the quilt that I make using your pattern? And my response is, yeah, that's great. You paid for the pattern. You can do what you want with your finished product. Am I, I mean, is that, that's right, right? Like I can't tell yeah. them, as a, I can't tell them as a pattern designer, you know, you can't sell the quilt that you make using my pattern. I don't have the right to do that. I fine, go ahead and sell it. Right. Is that Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. Um, Lonnie, I'm going to, do you have any other thoughts? I want to go through some of these questions that we're getting on no, let's go through the questions. Okay. So first of all, let's just say hello to everybody. We've got Texas, Brazil, Maryland, Germany, Oregon, Germany again. Um, Lori, there's somebody, or Lonnie, there's somebody from Litchfield, Illinois. <laughs> I saw that. And I, I, all these, uh, a number of these places I have a connection to. Uh, That's somebody's cool. from the Yukon, and I spend a fair bit of time from in the Yukon and, and South Africa. I spent time in South Africa. Yeah, um, Lonnie's a world traveler. <laughs> That's so cool. So um, we've got Georgia and Florida and New York, California. Ontario, Victoria, British Columbia, Dublin, Ireland. Welcome again. Great to have you here. And Costa Rica, our friend from Costa Rica, um, Alaska. Okay, so let's see. I've got a question here from Anna. This might not deal with, um, I, I'll probably, Anna, get to your question in a little bit um, because I want to focus on any question that you have that's related to copyright and um, use of an image or a pattern. While we have our good friend Lonnie here, I want to kind of focus on those questions. So I think I saw one come in here. Um, let's see. So someone just said, I thought you have to get every pattern copyrighted. Um, again, it's just it's presumed that if you create it, that you have the copyright. But if you're going to enforce that copyright, you might want to have it registered so that you have teeth when you go yeah. to sue them. <laughs> At the, yeah, at the time that you're going to do something about it, you need to get a lawyer. 
you're, you're okay. not going to be able to navigate that kind of thing by yourself. So that'll okay. help you know whether what you need to do at that point. Great. Awesome. Okay. So let's keep scrolling down here. Kentucky, Iowa. Okay. Um, here is a question. You can even generate more sales for the fabric designers if you mentioned that collection that you used for your pattern too, right? Absolutely. That, you know, we always as designers appreciate being at least acknowledged. Um, and I do think it's fair too, if you sell a finished quilt, a finished product, to tell the buyer that this was based on this pattern, this designer's pattern, just so that the seller doesn't feel like, you know, we don't want them finding out later that you used a pattern to create a quilt that you sold to them. Just be upfront and say, I used this, this pattern. Um, and then she also said, or do you use that collection for your kits and wonder if that's okay since you already purchased it? Let me think. I'm, Kind of confused you, you, about that. So, ahead, and I think this, I think this one that just came in a second ago, I always understood that if I use a pattern in a quilt, which I have purchased and I display a quilt at a show, I should mention who designed the original pattern. And I, I think that's the same, basically the same question. And I think, I think it's a good idea. And I think it's supportive of the other uh, artist, the, the designer. Yeah. Um, I, and, and it's also consistent with like, if you cite, if you quote something from a newspaper or an idea from a paper or a book, you should always say, this is where I get this idea. Right. Um, Save your sources. Whether it's a, whether it's a, if you don't say who the designer of a fabric you used as a small, relatively small part in a larger right. uh, thing, it's, it's pro it's, you know, it depends on the, the scope. If you, if you mm -hmm. just take their pattern and make a quilt out of it. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you probably should say it at that point, but if you take, if, if it's just bits and pieces and you've used lots of patterns and you don't say it, it's probably not a legal requirement that you say it. Right. But there might be good reasons for, for mentioning it. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's good clarification. It kind of depends on the scope too. So if you're using, if I'm using all K faucet fabric in this, I might want to say this is made entirely of K fabric, but because I'm using a whole huge assortment of designers, I've got a hundred different pieces in here that are from a variety of designers. I might not, it's less important, less important that I point out every single designer whose fabric I used. Um, so uh, Sandy said it, Sandy said it as well. You should always give credit where credit is due. That's right. Yep. And and that's just, I think that's just a matter of being, using common sense and being considerate, right? So I think that's yeah. great. Um, and, and supportive and, and yeah. of the whole, uh, and really it helps the whole industry and the whole art form. Right, exactly. Okay, so there's another question here from Cassandra. If you use a page from a coloring book, do you need permission? That's a great question. I would say probably. Okay. Better safe and than it sorry. Depends, it depends on how precise it is, but a coloring book is almost always going to be copyrighted. And if you yep. just lift it and use it as your own idea, it's not your own idea. Right. And so that, that um, probably is one where you need permission. Okay. That's a great idea too, because um, Amelia, there is a, coloring book that I have that's Tula Pink's and Tula Pink happens to be a big fabric designer, a big designer in the quilt industry. Somebody might not know that, but if you just swipe a page from Tula Pink's coloring book, oh, that's not good. Don't just claim that as your own. So I think as for a coloring book, yep, you may, you, you said it right, Lonnie, that it's going to be copyrighted. So go ahead and um, you probably need permission to use a, a coloring book page. Yeah, or, or change it significantly. Okay, good. Um, let's see, here's another question. Years ago, I bought craft patterns that said I could not make multiples and sell them for profit. Has that changed now? Or was that person the person that created that? Tell us about that, Lonnie. Look at that question and tell us what you think. I 
that's getting pretty specific and I'd have to, I'd have to look at the exact situation and, and be able to, okay. it, you know, if, if it, if a, if you buy a pattern and it says this, when you buy this, it's restricted to this kind of use, uh -huh. you should assume that that is correct. Okay. Unless you get le legal advice that says, no, that they don't, they can't limit you like that. One, okay. uh, one example of that is when you buy a DVD, uh -huh. uh, it, it, the license that you're given, they, they own a copyright on the movie. And they mm -hmm. sell you a license and the license is for private home use. And That's so right. If you, if you take your DVD and you put it in your workplace and play it on a loop in, and, and, and people see it as they come and go, you're outside your license. And they, okay. didn't, they didn't sell you that right to do that. And so if, okay. if you, a craft pattern says, we're not selling you this right, they're probably not selling you that right. Okay. So be be better be safe and acknowledge the what they say. <laughs> believe it. <laughs> yeah, believe it. Okay. Um, well, that sounds great, Lonnie. This has really been a super super helpful discussion. My goodness, I I have really learned a lot, and I'm really grateful for your time to help us kind of have some clarification on a few of these things and we might bring you back another time. Um, and I want everybody to know that I am paying Lonnie for his time here. <laughs> and I want everybody to know that I won't bill Emily for my time. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, I'm going to pay you for this. Don't, don't even Lonnie <laughs> put it on my bill. <laughs> Um, but I want to let you go so that uh, we don't take any more of your time. But thank you so much. You're you're just an awesome human being. I love you so much, Lonnie. You're the best. One of I love those. Love you too, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Salt and, of the and earth. Hopefully, we can get done with COVID and get back together and hang out. Really? Yeah. Seriously. So um, I want to let Lonnie you you go ahead and take off. Um, thank you again so much and we'll be in touch, but I'm going to stay on and we'll just um, do a few more little housekeeping things with with me and my studio and what's going on. So anyway, Lonnie, thanks again. You're the best. I really, really appreciate it. And um, Lonnie, if you want to look at this video afterwards, you can just find the video will be on YouTube, my Collage Quilter YouTube channel and the Collage Quilter um, Facebook Academy, let's see, the Collage Quilter Academy Facebook group, the Collage Quilter Academy, or <laughs> forget it, it's going to be, look up Collage Quilter on Facebook and it will be there, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks Emily. So, thanks Lonnie. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so let's see, Lonnie is gone and um, I just want to tell everybody Thank you so much for joining us here. If you have any more questions about copyright or if you're just joining us, you can watch this video again. Um, but basically the bottom line is you can't, we can't assume that we have the right to use something that we see online. Always assume that, well, we have to assume that there is a copyright protection. The minute an artist produces something, whether it's a photograph or a quilt or a design, it they have a presume a presumption of copyright. So always ask. Um, I think whenever any if somebody asks if they can sell a finished quilt that they've used, you know, made using my pattern, I always say yes, of course. Thank you for asking. I just love the consideration. Um, so better be safe than sorry. Always. And um, now I'm just gonna quickly uh, just share with you a little bit about what I've been doing. Um, I, you can see I finished this new Art in Bloom uh, design. So this is from my original Collage Quilter book. I'm rewriting that book, adding a lot more content and um, I'm super excited about that. So we've decided that I think I'm actually gonna frame this. I really like the way this turned out. I'm not going to quilt it. I think I'm going to frame it. And then, um, Amelia, will you hand me the tea party quilt that's on the floor? I got that done. I've been busy working hard on this stuff. 
Maybe you can just drape it over this. So this is the new um, Tea Party quilt. Do you want me to pin it? Uh, it's, yeah, it, it, if it won't stay there. So anyway, this is another thing that will be included in the book. Um, so I'm super excited about that. And what else do I have going on? So I've just been working on the book. Um, we are getting a lot of requests for maybe doing another um, uh, workshop next year. So my workshop in Midway, Utah is full and there's a waiting list now. And so I might open up another workshop for later in the fall. So probably first of October in 2022, but I do want your feedback. If it's something that interests you, I need to know. <laughs> so um, anyway, let's just double check that we have any, or is there anything else that we want to talk about, Amelia, about what's been going on in the studio? Um, do you want to mention our new supplies? Oh yeah. Okay. So we have some new supplies for sale at the, on the website, Collage Quilter. We're now selling the two types of irons that I love. Um, do we have any of them here? None that are not. Okay, so we've got a little mini iron that's the Aliso, Aliso brand. I think that's how you say it, but those cool little mini irons and the wool pressing mats and the wand irons, the clover wand irons. And what else do we have? The hot tools iron. Oh, rest. yeah, we've got a, a, little, a little iron silicone. rest, silicone yeah. iron rest. So anyway, we're trying to beef up the supplies so that Collage Quilter can be your one-stop shop for supplies and education and patterns. Um, so that's, we're still waiting on our final shipment of red fabric and then we'll get that one out, um, our fabric bundles. And, and now we're gonna be moving into fall and adding a few more bundles. So um, let me get back to any other questions that you, cause I've seen a few more questions come in and then um, we will, say adios so that I can get back to work. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so here's one. Um, I also purchased one-time use rights to a photograph to make a quilt. That's right. That's a good way to deal with it. Just buy the rights. It's not expensive. Um, and a lot of times um, photographers, even if you approach them, so even if you, so there are those websites where you can purchase artwork, purchase photography, um, but if you find something on Instagram that you like, like I've done that before, go ahead and ask the photographer, hey, I really love this. Can I can I use this? And I'll credit you. So a lot of them will. <clears throat> oh, you promised to do a little book review. Oh, yeah. Oh, I did promise to do a little book review. OK, so I'm going to just do I'm just going to review my my most recent favorite book. And then we're going to do a longer book review. And maybe I'll do a book review every single Monday so we can get through. Do you want to bring my stack of books over here so that we can talk about them? Um, I'm going to look at some more questions. So Susan just asked, I was wondering how you find time to get projects done. Any suggestions on finding time? Uh, Susan, that is actually a really, really great question um, because... I do, it is super important for me to find, to carve out the time to actually do the collage work. And, you know, I'm running a business now. I am a mom. I'm running and, and I'm a busy mom. My son has a ton of stuff going on. And so I, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, one thing I do is I like to get up early. I like to get a workout in, get my blood pumping. I kind of have a very specific routine in the mornings. Um, and then I have a hard, like, okay, I'm getting started at 10 o'clock in the morning and 10 to five o'clock is are my work hours. And I will allow myself this much time to get to be on Facebook and answer questions on Facebook. I will allow myself this much time to answer emails. And sometimes I get frustrated because those chunks take longer than I would like. Um, but it's becoming more and more important for me to kind of bring myself into the zone, turn on a good book so that I can have the quiet time that's required to kind of get into flow. And um, I, I'm still struggling. I'm still learning. But um, I, I also listen to a lot of books 
and kind of the book I just finished last week was called Atomic Habits. I highly recommend this book. Um, uh, and it is about how making small habits and stacking habits on top of each other uh, will help us to accomplish what we want to. So for example, I want to make sure that I have enough time to, to, to put into the actual creation. And um, so that's why I've stacked it with something that's really fun for me that I look forward to. And that's listening to a book. So I make sure that I do that every day. But anyway, he's got some great, really, really great information about how to be more disciplined in our habits and how to make those habits effective to do large changes in our life, in our lives. So anyway, um, that's kind of, those are kind of my thoughts, but let me get to, um, somebody just asked a really great, really great question um, about, let me, let me see if I can find it. Um, she, she asked, will you have kits with fabrics for any of your patterns? The hardest part is to find a variety of fabrics in a color palette. So that is um, what we're trying to do with our fabric bundles. So rather than kit a specific pattern, we are kitting our colors. So when you go to my website and for example, let's sit, just say a pink teapot like this, or, you know, this one or this one, um, you can buy the, the pink fabric bundle from Collage Quilter. And actually everything that I have, you, or all the colors are in here it, that I've used in my, in these designs are in my pink fabric bundle. So we're fleshing that out right now. We've got, um, let me just explain too. In the in each fabric bundle, they're sold according to color, and in that color, there are eighteen pieces, um, and it's sold from light to dark, and then warm and cool. So those are the those are the fabrics that I'm using to create my collage quilts. Now, do I have other fabric? Yes, because I have a I have a stash of fabric, but you also have other fabric. So um, this is just a way to make sure that you've got a really good variety in each color. Um, so anyway, that I hope that answers the question about, about fabric. Um, okay, so, and Teresa just asked, are you on Facebook only on Monday mornings at the same time slot? So I am on Facebook. I do this live video every Monday at 11 a.m. Mountain Time and it is streamed to Facebook and my Facebook groups and to YouTube. So you will always find me here, but that's not the only time I'm on Facebook. It's the only time I do a live video. So I also will post recorded videos on YouTube and um, I am interacting with people on Facebook every single day. So if you ever have a question and you're looking for an answer, it's a good idea to um, find one of my groups or my Facebook page and, and you can message me there too. Um, okay, let's get to one of the books that I recently looked at. So I, you can't see this entire stack. <laughs> I've got a big stack of quilt books and that's just a portion of them. Um, I love this quilt industry. There is something really, really special about it. and. I am, um, I love to buy books from the makers and the influencers in our industry. So one of the most recent books that I bought was this Engl English paper piecing book. Um, I have never done English paper piecing. I, it's probably not something that I will do anytime soon, but I do love to learn about the life and um, inspiration of the artists. So this is Florence Knapp who she runs a blog and, and this is her, this is her thing. And I was so inspired about her, the first section of this book about fabric and language. And she just one of the quotes from her book, fabric is so deeply rooted in our culture and society that it peppers everyday conversation, you know? So um, I, I just, I, 
loved this. And, and um, she talks about the meditative quality of, you know, the handwork that she does. And I'm like, yes, yes, this is the same. She is the same. We, um, there is something really super special about all quilters, all crafters. And I want to expose myself to the broader, broader community as well. And those who are really, really proficient and amazing in their, in their own niche. And she is one of them. So this was a great book. And um, so I, I was so impressed by it that I gave it to my daughter, Amelia. And I said, I don't care if you read the whole book, but you just have to read the first, the first little bit, because she talks about the history of quilts and history of piecing. And then she, she highlights other artists in the book as well. And and um, that's one thing I love about our community, the fact that we will support and um, showcase, highlight other artists and their accomplishments in our quilt world. So anyway, that's the book of the month or the book of the week. I love it. Uh, I got it on Amazon. So um, there you go. There's my first recommendation. And then outside of the quilt world, quilt world, I recommend the book Atomic Habits as a good listen while you're working. So anyway, um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I've got to run. I've got to get going on my work. And um, it's been fun. A big shout out and thank you to Lonnie Litchfield again, an attorney in Salt Lake City that's a friend of mine who joined us earlier. So Thank you, everybody, for being here. Have a wonderful day. Go do good. Brighten the world. And um, I'll see you again next week.